Hi. Um, I'm really excited to be at CSS DevConf. Um, I'm excited to be in Long Beach. I just um, flew from Barcelona for another, from another conference, so a little jet lagged, but doing okay. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, my name's Gina. Um, I work at Salesforce, so of course I have to say we are a publicly traded company. Please don't make any purchasing decisions based on anything I say. Moving on. Um, so I work on uh, the user experience team. Gosh. Oh well, I'll just deal with it. Uh, so I work on the user experience team at Salesforce, and I'm a senior designer on a team called Design Systems, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, I always like to start with this awesome quote by Paul Sappho. It says, it used to be that designers made an object and walked away. Today, the emphasis must shift to designing the entire life cycle. And I think this will kind of set the tone for uh, what I'm going to be talking about. So like I mentioned, I work at Salesforce, which is a really huge enterprise company. And product design in an enterprise organization can be tricky. A couple years ago, uh, we launched Salesforce One, which was our uh, mobile application. And a lot of the things that we learned in that process, of course, is you know, how to properly design for scale. And of course, you have all the multiple platforms and devices. There's all sorts of you know, tablets, phones, now you got watches, you even have refrigerators, like all sorts of things that are connected and uh, lots of different types of UI to think about. And in our world, we also have to consider designing for configuration, because a lot of um, uh, what we do has to be designed to be uh, customized and configured by our customers. They can basically move things around and add things, edit things, do whatever they want. Um, in our organization, we have lots of people involved. We have dozens of scrum teams. We have hundreds of developers. And in comparison, we have a relatively small team of designers. So designer and developer communication is really important. Uh, a lot of the types of questions you're going to get is like, well, where can I find the icons? What color is the button border? Where can I find the icons? And these type of things just happening over and over and over again. So a, a solution that a lot of companies have tried, even we've tried, is called red lines. And if you're not familiar with what red lines are, it's basically where you design a, spe uh, a spec for your, your UI. So you might spec out what the spacing, the sizing, what fonts to use, and so on. But as you can imagine, in an enterprise organization, or even just today's product design, even for smaller startups, uh, doing red lines at this scale is extremely painful, and I don't recommend it. Red line specs promote designing pages, and that's just not the way I, I feel solid uh, product design should be. I think designing uh, red lines are a fractured process. And as Nate Fortin says, a fractured process makes for a fractured user experience. It's all about designing systems. This is what a lot of people are starting to talk about today. There's even a talk earlier today that mentioned it as well. Um, if you're unfamiliar with what this actually means, uh, Nathan Curtis defines a design system as a definition of the architecture, content, visual and supporting assets, and templates to produce or sustain a consistent and effective product experience. So one tool that I really love that a lot of people are talking about these days is the style guide. Style guides are all the rage. They've come a long, long way. Um, and there's so many out there. People are putting them online. Um, you can check out styleguides.io, which is a really cool site that just has tons and tons of uh, podcasts, articles, uh, examples, presentations, all about style guides. Um, one of those articles I wrote back in 2008 called Writing an Enterprise Style, or sorry, Writing an Interface Style Guide. Um, back then, this was before I was really thinking about um, what people are now calling living style guides. I was actually um, using wikis and WordPresses, and yeah, it, it wasn't awesome. But I still loved the actual documentation process. Um, so some of the things in that article that I talked about were uh, brand and design standards, front end standards, and of course, keeping your style guide current and useful. Um, that's the really key part, though, keeping your style guide current and useful. Um, there was a talk earlier today that I mentioned that uh, brings this up, um, and it was called, um, what was it, like zombie pattern libraries? This is actually a phrase I love using for um, style guides that um, 
a lot of companies end up creating. So the way I like to think of what a zombie style guide is, is basically a style guide is not maintained and it's not part of your process. They basically, you know, they're pretty, you put them up, you get a lot of attention, but then you don't maintain it, they die, they rot, they eat your brains. Your style guides have to be living for them to be successful. So a living style guide is basically, uh, you have your documentation, your, your UI components, and then you have your code, that which actually is not just documented, but is used to actually display these elements in your style guide, and that's what makes it living. Um, some of you may have seen our old style guide, the ye old style guide of Salesforce One. It was really cool, I really liked it. Um, it's actually what led me to join this team because I thought it was pretty awesome. Um, and so last year at Dreamforce, um, I was at the booth demoing the, the style guide we had, and I talked to a lot of customers, a lot of partners, a lot of developers, and what I found out was that it actually didn't even solve the problem we were uh, trying to solve for our uh, developers building on our platform and in our ecosystem. It didn't really give them an official way to even use it. So a lot of the questions I got from these developers I was talking to, you know, how do I get my app to look like this? And can I use the CSS in my app? Um, so we found out that our partners and our customers that are building in our platform and ecosystem, they want their apps to look like Salesforce. And they want our design language, they want our best practices. So much so that um, a, about a year and a half ago, a third party group actually created a Salesforce-ish bootstrap theme and they distributed it and a lot of developers started using it in their own projects. But unfortunately, it was not maintained by us. So every time we updated the user interface or made any changes, it was out of sync and that's not good at all. <laughs> And a lot of our partners in apps actually, or partners that were building apps on our platform looked great, but they just didn't feel like they were part of the uh, Salesforce ecosystem. They needed better resources and they needed better tools. And they needed to be able to keep up with our fast moving design iterations. So this year um, at Dreamforce, we launched our new Lightning experience, which if you've been a Salesforce user by any chance, uh, this is like a dream come true because the old UI was Let's just call it classic. Uh, <laughs> so this is a modernized UI, and alongside designing uh, this uh, Lightning experience, we designed a design system uh, called the Lightning Design System. Uh, this is the project I work on. Um, the key thing that we wanted to make sure happened with these tools was that it was consistent with our Salesforce Lightning UI. <clears throat> so there's a quote by Mark Otto in his presentation about how to create your own bootstrap, and he says, great design systems are usable by your entire team. We found that the old style guide we had was really just useful for us, but it wasn't useful for developers or um, basically anyone else in our organization. So we wanted to fix that. Um, so you might be wondering, in um, a company like mine, how we even achieve maintaining consistency across such a massive organization. Like we have lots and lots of products, we have lots of teams, we acquire companies and they fall in line to our patterns. Like how do we maintain consistency across all of this? And as we are making these future visual design changes, you know, each iteration, um, how do we make that faster on our end as well as for the people that are uh, making use of our platform? And what was really important for us was um, how to keep our design system agnostic. And what I mean by that is, you know, we have a lot of developers working on all sorts of platforms. You might be working in Java, you might be working in Rails, you might be working in Node, you might be doing native code. Like, there's all sorts of different ways you can consume our design system. So we needed our design system to be able to be leveraged in as many places as possible. So a phrase we like to use a lot is single source of truth. And if you're not familiar with this phrase, it's basically another way of talking about being dry or don't repeat yourself. Uh, the dry principle states that every piece of knowledge must have a single, unambiguous, authoritative representation within a system. So in terms of our visual design, uh, we created a system called design tokens. These are the basic, basic, basic atoms of our lightning design system. You can kind of think of them as sort of like SAS variables in a way. Um, and design tokens help us scale our design across both web and native applications. 
So things that are design tokens are, um, you know, you got your font weights, sizes, line heights, colors, uh, background colors, text colors, shadows, animations, Z indexes, like all that stuff that you want to uh, keep consistent. Uh, we store it as what we call a design token. And so for the designers who are still doing redline specifications, uh, instead of uh, referring to pixel values, they will refer to these design tokens in their specification. So what that will look like is instead of putting like 10 pixels, you would say something like spacing medium or whatever the token is. And we name all our tokens um, in a way that you can tell how they're used and where to use them. And um, they're all um, namespaced by what type of token they are, and we can run tests to make sure that you're using these tokens in the proper places. So if you're using a border radius token, you can't really try to use that token on a spacing token, and so, uh, so on. So to be able to make this um, work for our developers is we created an open source tool called Theo, and Theo basically generates these design tokens. And this is how we achieve our framework agnostic approach that we're trying to go for. So Theo is a JSON file that my team uh, maintains, and um, we um, plug this into our continuous integration environment, and um, what Theo will take our JSON file and do is convert it into SAS variables, less variables, stylus variables, those are all common CSS preprocessors, Lightning, which is our internal um, production platform, and as well as you know, JSON for iOS, XML for Android, our style guide, and we even generate color swatches for our designers to use for Photoshop and Sketch. So an example of what that looks like, in the top left corner, uh, you see the JSON file that we maintain, so we'll um, give it a name, we give it a value, we categorize it, uh, we um, you know, might have an additional comment for usage, and then in the top right, you see the SAS variable that's generated from this, and this is what our team uses for the style guide and our prototypes. And then at the bottom, you see Lightning, which is what our uh, production uh, development team uses, which is uh, what they call Aura tokens. And then you can see um, the swatch from Photoshop. These are all um, color swatches that have been generated from this as well, and they're all named so designers know where to use them. The cool thing that this brings is no more hard-coded values, and this is really awesome for pre uh, preventing errors. Um, a well-built design system aligns your whole team. So it's really important that you're bringing designers, engineers, uh, product managers, researchers, prototypers, like all the people that are involved in your project, um, you bring all these people together around a single goal. Um, something that um, is a little unique to Salesforce, but we like to talk about it because we think it's pretty cool, um, is how we actually uh, try to align our whole organization around a single goal. So CEO Mark Benioff wrote a post about this that you can check out. The slides will be available later, so you can, don't have to write down URLs. Um, and he basically talks about um, how we do this, and he has this quote in the post that says, while a company is growing fast, there's nothing more important than constant communication and complete alignment. And so the system that we use is called a V2 MOM. Um, it's basically vision, values, methods, obstacles, and metrics. So um, as a company, every year, we all come together and do this for our personal, um, what we want to achieve, achieve that year, but we also do this for all our uh, projects. So our design system has a V2 MOM that's written for it. So the vision being one to three sentences that describe what you plan to achieve this year. The values are guiding principles or beliefs that are um, uh, most important to you as you work to achieve your vision. The methods are the actions you'll take to achieve your vision. The obstacles or challenges you have to overcome to achieve your vision. And the measures are how you will measure success for each method. So I'm gonna focus a little more just on the vision aspect of it, which is really important for us in all our projects. Um, it's really important to have a very clear vision to align efforts. Uh, so before we got started working on the Lightning experience as well as our Lightning design system, we put together design principles. And um, the order that I'm going to say them in is intentional, and they're ordered by priority. Uh, so the first design principle is clarity. 
and be, excuse me, eliminate ambiguity, enable people to see, understand, and act with confidence. This is the most important goal of all, and um, clarity is, is a very common word um, that I hear a lot, because it's, it's just incredibly important. And I don't think this just imply, applies for Salesforce. I think this applies for everyone working on any product. Number two is efficiency. Uh, streamline and optimize workflows. Intelligently anticipate needs to help people work better, faster, and smarter. Um, obviously, we want people to be able to work better, so uh, this is really important for us. And you might be surprised that number three, especially in a talk about a design system, is consistency. Like, why is that so low? Um, well, uh, consistency is really, really important, and obviously, um, it has value, but we truly believe clarity and efficiency is way more important uh, than consistency, so that's why it's number three. Uh, create familiarity, strengthen intuition, and applying the same solution to the same problem. And the fourth principle, of course, is beauty. Demonstrate respect for people's time and attention through thoughtful and elegant craftsmanship. Um, so those are our design principles, and I think it's really important that whatever you're working on, you come up with your own design principles. Um, I found this site called Design Principles, uh, FTW.com, um, and it was, it's like a, a collection of design principles that people have, people and companies have put out there. So you can kind of check out a whole, like, basically like a gallery of design principles that other people have done and get some inspiration. Um, another place you can check out design principles, uh, Jeremy Keith has principles.adactio.com, and he puts, um, like a, it's a basically a huge collection of design principles, not just for web projects or software projects, but even for things like food, like all sorts of stuff is on there. So I, I recommend checking those out for inspiration and finding what your own design principles are for you. <coughs> uh, Yesenia Perez-Cruz uh, says, a beautiful design system is about finding the same balance of consistency and variety too, systemic, uh, too systematic, and the design becomes predictable and repetitive. Too much variation, and the system is confusing and overwhelming. I think this is really important, and it's why consistency is number three for us in the priority order. Um, obviously, it's important. Obviously, you want it to not be confusing, but you, you need to have room for it to be able to change, evolve, and grow. There's a really great article that just came out recently by Sophia um, Bachevsky. Sorry, I'm really horrible with <laughs> pronunciation. But um, it's called Object-Oriented UX. And I highly recommend um, checking it out later. Uh, one of the things that she says in this article is focus first on designing the system of real world objects, then on designing a system of implementation to bring it all to life. Um, when people talk about design systems at conferences or write articles about it, I feel like a lot of it is usually around CSS frameworks, style guides, and these are all definitely a part of it, but um, I think a lot of design systems um, to truly succeed need to also think about uh, the real world objects or um, as she's talking about, like the different like flows and, and objects in the UI that you're designing. So it's really incredibly important to have your design patterns and guidelines um, thought through before you even start thinking about CSS or what the style guide is going to look like. So uh, design guidelines uh, are, you know, things like your principles that I just mentioned, um, even how you approach color, motion, typography. And, you know, every style guide that's been put out, they always put their color palette. And, um, you know, it's good to do. I definitely recommend it. Um, but I think it's really important to think even further through the color palette and document. It's like how uh, you use that color. So it could be like how color is applied in visual messaging. It could be how you use color to show visual differentiation. Um, how you use color for visual hierarchy. And even like how you handle color contrast and accessibility. Um, as a side note of accessibility, this is another really incredibly important thing for us. And so we have automated testing to always check to make sure our colors are contrasted enough. Um, and this is what, um, uh, just a part of what we're trying to do to make sure our customers that are using our design system feel like it's trustworthy and that they can rely on it um, to enable them to make great products that are 
uh, compliant and so forth. So, um, so those are the things like the visual, but then there's also things like design patterns, like your interactions. So these could be anything from messaging, the way you display data, um, how you enter data and so forth. So, you know, as you're showing things like navigation and all the different types, like breadcrumbs, tabs, modals, and so on, think also, like, why do you use the modal? Um, you know, why is it important to use it in this particular case? And think that through. Uh, Brendan Cornwall said, creating a positive experience is not about having best practices. It's about putting those practices into the right hands. Um, so, Obviously, you want to make sure that there's tools and um, things that people can actually use, not just guidelines. So this is, now we can start talking about, you know, CSS frameworks and, and whatnot. So we, obviously, like most of these that are out right now, we have HTML, we have CSS, we have icons, we have fonts. Um, so the design system components is basically like our UI library and our CSS framework. Um, the goals that we had in place for it, and the reason that we did it, you know, I, I talked about the conversations that I have with people at Dreamforce. Um, we really wanted to empower our developers to provide uh, developers scalable and accessible code at the beginning of the development cycle. Because what we found happening was um, developers were kind of like uh, building things not in sync with the design team, and then, you know, certain things don't get built correctly or things aren't built accessibly and then a bunch of bugs get filed and you go through the whole like bug uh, squashing phase and it's just much better to uh, do this at the beginning and work through it together so you can avoid all that towards the end. We also wanted to empower our designers to design and iterate more efficiently in the browser. You know, designers are known to change their minds a lot. I know I do. And I, I can just say in my experience, moving HTML around is just so much faster than trying to reflow big sketch files and UI kits. So I mentioned the design principles, clarity being number one um, in our CSS framework, which I'm not gonna go too much into um, uh, right now because I wanted to kind of focus more on the, the principles of it. But clarity is important and a lot of people try to be brief when they name things, uh, especially in CSS and, and in documentation. And I think clarity um, rules above all and should, um, as you're picking your class names, uh, you should be making sure that somebody can look at it and know exactly how to use it um, rather than guessing, oh, what does this abbreviation even stand for? Uh, another Nathan Curtis quote, uh, he talks a lot about design systems, so check out his work if you're interested. Uh, he says, for each component, you must decide what will unite the design across the viewports to maintain that consistent feel and what parts of the design will differentiate in order to provide a flexible and optimal experience for different viewport sizes. I think this is a, another key part of building a CSS framework and UI library as part of a design system is, um, you know, you want the consistency, but you need to allow for um, flexibility across, you know, wherever the context um, the design may be in. So the way we've got things organized is we have our dependencies, which are the design tokens that I mentioned earlier. And then we created some utilities, which are like non-semantic single purpose classes. Um, one of the things I found out um, building an enterprise CSS framework is that I write CSS for Salesforce way differently than I write CSS for me. Um, I, in my own personal work, I don't really use a lot of non-semantic uh, single-purpose classes. But for our huge um, ecosystem of developers, we found that we needed these. So these are classes that apply uh, specific type styles, um, so like headings, uh, spacing, um, even things like truncation and so on. And then those are both um, uh, consumed by our objects or our components. And of course, you want to build those lightweight, modular, and reusable. So a lot of people build CSS frameworks these days. There's like so many of them out there. Um, I, my personal key takeaway that I found in building this that I want to share is I think it's really incredibly important to don't make whatever the thing is until you need it. Like stay lean. Everybody tries to build like these kitchen sink 
libraries that have everything and anything you might need. And chances are you're probably only using like six things. Um, so we felt, you know, in order to really build things in a um, really um, uh, lean way, was, you know, wait till we actually needed the thing and then we built it. And that way we were able to stay focused and really build it to the best that it can be, build it accessibly, uh, put it through its testing paces, and so on. And I think this provides much clearer communication. It's much better than asking over and over again, where can I find the icons? <laughs> and it also is helping us build much better prototypes, because a lot of um, the developers we were working with and engineers, you know, they get kind of caught up on like, how it's going to look, but by providing this framework for them, they can move a lot quicker um, and a lot faster. And of course, the, the thing that I love most is that there's no more proliferation of inconsistent styles. So everybody's happy. Um, and a lot of our designers are happy because now they're starting to uh, design in the browser. Some of them are already moving very quickly. Some of them you know, still are getting trained. Uh, we actually have CSS office hours every week um, on my team. And so we help educate and train uh, both our engineers and our designers in how to uh, use CSS in the design system. Um, and it means that our, our um, design system website is basically a living specification. So um, that's really important for me because I think it helps kill the red line uh, process and it just makes us work a lot better. So another key part that I think that will really make um, your design system living and not become a zombie is the team behind it. Um, I think a good design system needs a team. Um, a couple of weeks ago, Nathan Curtis wrote a really great article called Team Models for Scaling a Design System. And the three models that he's observed and he talks about is uh, one being solitary. And he describes this as like the bootstrap model where they built it for them and then they distribute it for everybody else to use. But you know, it's still all about what they want, what they need, all the the goals are about them, um, but you can use it if you want. And then you have the centralized team model where you have a team that their job is to support and produce the design system and uh, people within the organization kind of say, hey, I need this thing, so then they go build it and then they give it back to whoever needed it. And then the third model is federated. And what federated is is where you have designers from multiple product teams in your organization that all work together to decide on the design system together. And so you might have like key people in each group that are very knowledgeable about design systems or CSS, and you get all these people together to decide on the system together. So at the end of his post, he asks, you know, well, how do you do it? And so um, if you're interested in our team model, I, I wrote a response post um, called the Salesforce team model for scaling a design system. And um, the way I think of it is not really a new model at all, but it's really sort of a blending of model two and model three, which is um, the centralized team with uh, federated collaborators. And so if I were to name this, I guess I would call it cyclical. Because um, the way we work, we have our, our centralized design team, which I'm on, and then we have a lot of people throughout our organization that we work very closely with. So we get that federated collaboration. And it's very cyclical because as I'm pairing with these people, um, our design system is informing their product design, but their product design in turn informs the design system. So they're going to you know, do their own research, their own um, prototyping, their own designing, and they're going to come up with new patterns or maybe uh, augmented versions of current patterns. Or um, maybe they don't. Maybe there's a pattern that I can say, oh, actually, you don't need to do this because this already exists. But it's just a very cyclical thing, and I think it works really well. Um, I think um, the important thing, though, is that um, all, all the best systems need human guidance in order to succeed and survive. I am all for automation, and I love automating things as much as possible. But um, the reason I think a, a team is important, or like people that maintain it, is because you're going to get that human guidance to help really make it living and um, keep it thriving. So 
the centralized design team, um, they basically act like a librarian, a distributor, facilitator, and you know, we make sure that it's maintained and crafted with quality. Uh, and then the federated design system contributors that we work with that are distributed throughout the organization, um, they, you know, they're out in the trenches. They're able to um, bring back um, research and such to help like, keep the design system accurate current and actually useful. And then finally, I think an uh, important thing about design systems that I want to mention is making better design decisions. Obviously, in something like a huge organization or even a small organization, you're going to have a lot of people that are very opinionated. They have their different things that they think should be in there, things that they don't think should be in there. Um, and you can imagine, we have a lot of <laughs> very healthy debates. And um, I, I uh, recently read an article that I, I shared with the team and we started adopting this practice and it's been kind of awesome. Um, and it's an article by Cab Watkins, which um, I'm not going to read the heading out loud because I don't like to cuss when I present. But um, basically the way it works is you have a sliding scale of how much you really care about what you're arguing for. So if you're like a, a one, that means you don't really care that much, you're just talking to be talking. But if you're like a 10, and very rarely is somebody really a 10, truly, um, like this is like life or death. So usually, you know, people are somewhere between like a three to like maybe a six or even a seven. So if I'm a seven and you're a three, I win. And so um, this is something that's been super helpful in like trying to, you know, decide how we're going to build things, how we're going to architect things. But even more important in making design decisions, um, is your design principles. So design standards are cool. I love design standards, and they're really important. But more important than design standards are your design principles. These are what should guide you and what should drive your decision making. So again, um, I mentioned the design principles for us are clarity, efficiency, consistency, and beauty. So anytime we're having a conversation where it's like, oh, well, we have to make this button gray because then it's consistent. but Really, if we made it black or whatever color, it would make it a lot more clear. That's actually going to win because that is the order of operations for the way we run um, our decisions. So um, consistency over beauty, efficiency over consistency, clarity over efficiency. Um, there's a fantastic quote by Luke Wobrowski that says, design considerations beat design patterns. Test and decide. Don't just copy things like the hamburger icon. So we're really, um, we really value research, and we um, are constantly testing. Sometimes something will work now, but tomorrow it may no longer work. So you're going to have to revise and iterate. And that's OK. I think that's what makes a design system truly last. And then finally, um, it is open source, so <laughs> we're always looking for people to check things out and contribute. Um, so please check out the, the stuff we're doing because we, we, we want to learn how other people are approaching this. And I, I've been speaking at a couple conferences and noticed there's always a talk or two that are talking about similar things. And it's cool because a lot of people are coming up with their own techniques and their own ways of doing things. And um, that's really what's amazing about the community around this. So um, if, if you haven't considered open sourcing your own work, I, I highly encourage you to do it, because you're going to learn a lot from it. Um, so you can check out Salesforce-UX on GitHub to see Theo, our design system, and all that stuff. Um, and uh, you know, follow us on Twitter at SalesforceUX. And there's a quote by Gustav Flaubert that I, I really love, uh, which says, be regular and orderly in your life, so that you may be violent and original in your work. Thank you.